Well, the Royals are apparently in the market for a closer to add to this team. So who's out there that makes sense? We'll tell you next on Locked on Royals. You are Locked on Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are tuned in to another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. Give me a follow on Twitter or X at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. You also can catch us on wherever you listen to your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts. We're on Odyssey. We're also on YouTube. If you ever want to watch a live stream of our podcast. Uh, you can check us out over there on that channel. Be sure to be our next subscriber. Our goal is to get to 1,000 by opening day 2024. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Big, big game coming up in Kansas City, or at least if you're a fan of Kansas City or Baltimore or Detroit or the Niners, of course, in San Francisco. Uh, lots of things to bet on, not just money lines, not just spreads. You can play, bet on some player props that can make the game a whole lot more fun for you. So go to FanDuel. Create your account and start placing some bets today. If you're a first-time listener and you want to know a little bit more about me, well, I work in sports here in Kansas City. I work at Sports Radio 810 WHB. I actually have a show tonight from 7 to 10 p.m., so if you want to check me out over there on maybe some football-related things, college basketball-related things, uh, you can uh, hear me speak freely on that for about three hours on 810 tonight. I also have a show Monday through Friday on ESPN Kansas City, 10 to 11 a.m., so very easy to find me uh, for other talk radio if you're interested in that. But when you click on this podcast link, you know that you are getting 30 straight minutes of Royals baseball, which is what, you know, everybody is kind of gearing up for now. You know, uh, back to the first time listeners here, uh, we usually do five episodes a week. You know, that is something that we are going to get back into the rhythm of, that we are going to... Uh, be more consistent with. But in the offseason, and especially this point in the offseason, only about three episodes a week. Now, the good news is we've been picking Mailbag Fridays back up. We want to make sure that you, the listener, are heard from, your questions are answered, and we'll be taking that on in tomorrow's episode. As for today, some pretty big news came out in a Mailbag segment, ironically, from Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic, and he brought up the fact, it seems like, that the Royals do not view their offseason as finished. They still want to add to this roster and more specifically to that bullpen. And even more specific than that, they want to add a closer. And uh, that brings up a lot of questions for sure because they went out there and they signed Will Smith to a cheaper deal. Uh, he has a lot of experience closing out games. So the casual... I guess, viewer of baseball would say, there you go, there's your closer. And I think not really think twice of it because Will Smith was a move the Royals, I don't think, would have made in past years. You know, going after somebody and giving a bullpen guy five, six, seven million, it just, that wasn't the way they operated the last few years. They'd more so go after minor league deal guys or $1 million, $2 million deal guys uh, that more so fit their price range. Not saying Will Smith was way out there, but, you know, they added a couple of pieces of that bullpen. Nick Anderson, Chris Stratton, and Will Smith. Now the question becomes, who are you trying to replace in this bullpen? And more, maybe more importantly, who are you looking for as a closer? Um, of course, the names are going to be thrown out there like Devin Williams. Uh, Devin Williams from Milwaukee is one of the best closers. That, by far and away, I think would be the home run deal. But we all know, let's be honest, we all know the Royals have nowhere near the resources to acquire somebody like that for the back end of their bullpen. Another name that comes up is Kenley Jansen. Um, Kenley Jansen is said to make about $16 million this year for the Boston Red Sox. Is that a contract you're willing to take on? Because um, Kenley Jansen is nearing the end of his career. Uh, he certainly makes his bullpen better, but for that price, it makes you wonder. And the reason I think that's unlikely is because the Royals had every capability of bringing Aroldis Chapman back for 
five and a half less or four and a half less, whatever that would be, than what Kenley Jansen is making. So that kind of feels, you know, a very much a long shot. I, I don't think the Royals are going to, you know, trade away prospects to get a, a closer that's on the back end of 30, 35, I should say. There are some guys, though, that make sense, and for a few reasons. One, I think the most you know notable thing here, they, they got to be in the price range. They got to be affordable for the Royals, and they can't require uh, high-end players. I don't think the Royals are going to be willing to part ways with their starters right now, not in the rotation, just starters in general. You know, if you're thinking MJ Melendez is going to be packaged, I don't see that likely because they don't really have a backup option for left field at this point in time. I don't see them trading a Kyle Isbell. Now, Drew Waters makes a little bit of sense if if the price really fits or if the the deal is valuable on both ends. But it's kind of funny to me that two of the guys I piece together here, and I wonder if the Royals have made a call, are on the same team. And that's the Washington Nationals with Kyle Finnegan and Hunter Harvey. The reason I think this could make sense is – both of these guys do not have long, long careers of, of closing experience. They don't. Uh, Kyle Finnegan, most recently, you know, had near 30 saves this year. Um, very, very firm fastball. I mean, he's sitting in the 95th, 96th percentile in fastball velocity. Hunter Harvey, about the same thing. Now, Harvey's, I don't want to say much better. I was about to say much better, but a little bit better. Well, let's leave it at that. Um, but I don't think the Nationals would be willing to part ways with him, who's a little bit younger. I think an additional year of control. If not, I think it's just two years of control right now for both of these guys. Finnegan's 32. Both these guys have power stuff. Um, Finnegan's got the closing experience. Hunter Harvey had about 10 saves last year. So the Nationals going into this year are kind of co-oping uh, their closer role, which brings up the question, do they want to have a, a co-op role? Can they get value and trading one of those guys to, let's say, a Kansas City, right, to be their back-end closer. Um, I would not be upset with either of those two options. Um, Kyle Finnegan, I've always loved the fastball. The numbers don't pop a ton. He also blew, I think, seven or eight saves last year. But he is, by definition, a closer. You would be acquiring a closer, not like Hunter Harvey, who's a setup guy you're turning into a closer, which that's kind of what I'm trying to piece together uh, with uh, J.J. Bacola and his plan this year is if you're acquiring a closer, are you trying to bring in somebody who's been blocked as being the closer? That doesn't seem likely because you've got a lot of guys who can become closers. I think they are going after a closer, somebody that was a closer last year, not so much of a setup guy who can become a closer. That's kind of where I'm, I'm finding you know, more of the information on. That's kind of where I'm, I'm zeroing in on. It doesn't make sense to go acquire another bullpen guy to make your closer who's not a closer. You have those guys in your bullpen right now, and you have closing experience with Will Smith. So those are two guys I'm wondering if they're on the Royals' radar. Affordable, I don't think Kyle Finnegan would cost the world. Maybe not Hunter Harvey either because he's nearing age 30. If not, I think he is 30 years old, and we know bullpen arms are expendable. Uh, the other name that popped up in my mind was Carlos Estevez of the LA Angels. Um, another guy with power stuff um, had over 30 saves last year. He was an all-star for the first time in his career last year. And keep in mind, the Angels just signed Robert Stevenson and Matt Moore. Two guys making a lot of money in the back end of their bullpen. If they wanted to hand over the reins to a Robert Stevenson, well, where does that leave Carlos Estevez, who wasn't that great in the second half of the season? He more so got the all-star nod because he had a lot of saves in the first half of power stuff there um, can struggle a little bit with command, which might repel the Royals, but it's a name. I, I went through every single team in major league baseball and looked at the likelihood of those guys being moved. And then also the role that guy was in. The reason I don't think, you know, Kenley Jansen's not moving on from Boston, not only because of the price, but number two, he's their closer. Right, you're you're not going to see a team that is trying to contend just move off their closer and give them to the Royals. It's going to be a team that's in the middle of a rebuild, which the Nationals are committed to a rebuild. Maybe they see Kyle Finnegan or Hunter Harvey as guys that uh, they don't really need to have both of. You know, what's the point in having two closers on the team? 
Now, I've also been very vocal about you don't really need a closer if you're not a good baseball team. It's clear, though, that J.J. Piccolo believes this team needs to compete, and the numbers last year were putrid in, in save situations. The Royals had 53 save opportunities last year and blew 25 of them. They were tied for last in baseball with the Mets in save opportunities, yet still succeeded only 53% of the time. Ugly. You know, and maybe the Royals want more consistency. They don't want to have to wonder who's taking the ball in the ninth. They just want to hand it over to somebody who's been there. So those three names, uh, I think, make the most sense in the price range of the Royals and what they'd be willing to give up in either their farm system or on the bench at their big league ball club. So that's kind of where I'm at. If you've got somebody that comes to mind, let us know in the YouTube comments or let me know on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, at J underscore 15. We'll take our first break of the show. When we come back, who really is the number one of this rotation? We'll dive into that next on Locked On Royals. You are tuned into Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I am your host, Jack Johnson. Give me a follow on Twitter or X at Johnny J underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. You can also catch us on wherever you get your podcasts. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts. We're also on Odyssey and we're on YouTube. Just be sure to hit that follow button and subscribe before we go any further let's give a shout out to the title sponsor today in FanDuel the NFL postseason is wrapping up but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel America's number one sports book right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet that's 150 bucks in bonus bets win or lose the app is so easy to use and there are so many different ways to bet like live same-game parlays, finding bets in the new Explore tab, making a parlay in the Parlay Hub, which, by the way, is the best way to find those popular parlays, and much, much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. And it doesn't just have to be spreads. doesn't just have to be, you know, money line bets. If you just want to bet on the winner and loser of this game, that's fine. But there's player props. You know, there's totals in the first half and quarters. There's a lot of different ways you can bet on games. And it's not just football. I'm just saying football because there's a pretty big game coming up for the Kansas City Chiefs this Sunday. AFC title game for the sixth consecutive year, and this time against Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens. But college basketball is in full swing. The NCAA tournament is going to be coming up in about, you know, a month and a half here. Maybe a little bit more than that, two months, I should say. So start getting comfortable with the app. Start placing some bets and start winning some money on FanDuel. So after this podcast, go over and create your FanDuel account today. I've been getting this question a lot over the last couple weeks, and I think it's a very valid question. I think there's a lot of different arguments uh, for a question like this because it really comes down to what you value and a number one pitcher in the rotation. It's no surprise to anybody. The Royals have a couple of options now. And in fact, all four of these guys at their best would be in the running for a number one spot on this team. You know, with Cole Reagans at his best, he by far and away is the best pitcher, not only on the team and the entire organization. You know, at Michael Walk at his best, he's probably the most stable. Um, and I think he's got the best swing and miss stuff when he's completely on. Seth Lugo last year in, in the height of his season, uh, the pinnacle of his season, I mean, quality start after quality start after quality start, kind of like with Waka, consistency, good swing and miss stuff, uh, not walking too many guys. And Brady Singer, you know, it, it's common to have a bad taste in your mouth after what you saw last year, but at his prime, uh, when he had his 2022 season, that was a number one for the Kansas City Royals. So four guys, and then you just exclude Jordan Lyles from this conversation, all would have a pretty good chance to be a one in the rotation at their best. But we all know in baseball, that's not how it works. I mean, the Royals are not going to get all four of these guys at the best of their game this year. It's just not the way it's going to happen. If they do, uh, lock in an AL Central title right now because you get four guys performing at the top of their game. Uh, that's that's fantasy stuff, to be honest with you. But back to this question, right? Who is the number one? And there's so many different ways you can go, as I pointed out with the four guys. However, I think that it's very telling to me who J.J. Bacola in the front office want to be the number one. Um, I thought at first Seth Lugo was going to be this team's one because they had spent 
15 million dollars a year to bring him to Kansas City. And it wasn't that Cole Reagans wasn't capable. It's that Cole Reagans has never been a full-time starter in his career. As good as he looked, we all know how good of a pitcher he can be. It's foolish, though, to take that sample size and say, there's our workhorse. There's our 200-inning guy. I don't think the Royals are going to have a 200-inning guy this year. But if you can have 160 to 170 from Cole Reagans and Brady Singer, 150 apiece from Michael Walk and Seth Lugo, and it balances out, then really in the end, you don't need that workhorse, that true number one. Um, I think you can be very well balanced. The good thing is you've leveled out the playing field against your opponents with a stabilized rotation, and then you've kind of got this star in the making and Cole Reagans, that if he takes what he did at the back half of last year and just tears through the American League, then by just default, you've got your number one. To begin the year, though, I think it's Waka. I think they have paid Waka to be the number one. And he's got postseason experience. He's got you know, full season starting experience. You know, he knows what it takes to be a number one. Do I believe he's the number one moving forward into July and August? Hopefully not. Hopefully that's Cole Reagans at the point. Because you want him to take the reins. Naturally, though, not by force, you want him to naturally ease into that. Now, the question I have for those listening out there is, where do you, I guess, where do you place the importance of an opening day starter? I'm trying to you know, find my words here. How important is it really to be an opening day starter? How much does it mean for you the rest of the year? I mean, keep in mind, Zach Granke has been the opening day starter the last two years, and by no way, shape, or form is he a number one, at least not at this point in his career. So I have tossed out the idea that Michael Walker is this team's opening day starter because he's the first guy that takes the bump. Then, by the way, the rotation cycles, he's the number one. He was the first one to climb the bump regular season, and you hope that you know, he'll be that guy by the end of it. Or does Matt Quatrero, does this coaching staff go, all right, we, we have Waka, we've got Lugo. It doesn't really matter where we start him in the rotation. We want him to get as many starts as possible. But our home run hitter, uh, to use a weird analogy there, the opposite side of the dish, but it, you have this this true ace in the making with ace stuff, but he's never done it before. How, that, my question is, how much do you buy into that? You know, if you start on opening day, is that a lot of pressure for a guy that maybe shouldn't have that type of pressure? Or do you say, you know, let's, let's go. It doesn't matter. It's one game of 162. So that's what I'm going to be looking for in spring training and the way that Matt Quattrero, Brian Sweeney, Zach Bove, you know, Mitch Stetter, they, they handle something like this. Uh, because you've got, two guys that were brought in here to anchor this rotation, to make it uh, a much more durable and consistent and effective rotation. You're not wondering every fifth day who's going to take the mound. You're not wondering every fifth day if your starter's going to give up seven runs in two innings or if they're going to get through five or six without allowing a run. You just don't know. And most managers don't want that in their rotation, even if it is boom or bust. Like Brady Singer is boom or bust to me. He's either going to go through six or seven innings, 10 strikeouts, you know, one hit, two hits, or he's going to be roughed up for eight and two innings. You don't want to have three or four of those guys, and you know with Waka and Lugo, it evens it out a little bit. To me, I still believe Waka is that guy. You're paying him the money to be the number one. I do believe down the road, though, if he stays healthy, he continues to build on the success of last year, Cole Reagans does become the number one of the Kansas City Royals. That's just where I'm at right now. I think it goes Waka, then I think it goes Reagans, then I think it goes Lugo, which you're paying a guy $15 million a year to be your third guy in the rotation. And that's a huge upgrade, considering it was Jordan Lyles last year, or Chris Bubich last year as the number three. That's where it was. So I got Waka, Reagans, Lugo, Singer, and Lyles as the number five guy. Could Lyles always be salary dump? Sure. 
I've got no reason to believe it right now, though. But for the number one to answer that question, I'm going to go walk it. Let me know in the YouTube comments or on Twitter or X, whatever you call it, on who you think is going to be the number one, the opening day starter for the Kansas City Royals. Before we go on to our final segment, a shout out to Locked On Sports Today. It's here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel. When we return, I'm going to ask the question of what is considered to be a failure this year? How many wins do the Royals have to get to? Which players have to progress? And how can they avoid that said failure? We'll find out next on Lockdown Royals. You are tuned into Lockdown Royals on the Lockdown Podcast Network. I am your host, Jack Johnson. Give me a follow on Twitter, X at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore one five. The last thing I want to dive into today is what is considered to be a failure for the 2024 Kansas City Royals. How many wins do they have to get to? How do they keep fans engaged? I think a lot of questions that everybody's going to be wondering is when do you start to believe in this team and when would you give up on this team? I mean, it's been a really, really brutal stretch post-World Series. I mean, this team has not you know, pieced together a winning record since 2015. I mean, you're coming up on a decade now of not having a team that is enjoyable to watch from start to finish. Now, it's a tall task to be a team that from the end of March to the end of September, you are engaging your fan base. We've also seen, though, for the Kansas City Royals, that this this fan base, Kauffman Stadium, will support the team when they're winning games. And it doesn't need to be a a 95-100 win team. If they're in it, if they're in the wild card hunt by August, the place is going to be pretty full. Not that it's, you know, bandwagon fans or anything, but I think that goes for every Major League Baseball team out there. When there's 162 games, you know, you're not going to be showing up and packing the house every single night. Few teams have that type of power, have that type of pull. Small market teams, ones that have lost a lot over the last decade, you're not going to have the same fan support. The hope is that this team is drawing a lot of people to Kauffman Stadium. They're fun to watch. They're engaging you all the way into September, and they'll give themselves a fighting chance at a playoff spot, which has evaded the Royals since 2015. I mean, even the two years after the World Series, when they had pretty much the same roster, they were 500 and then two games below 500. Yeah, fun for a chunk of the year, but never really pulled away. So like 2017 was the last time we had that feeling. That feeling of, there's meaningful baseball here as the weather's getting a little bit colder. I've got a reason to go to Kauffman Stadium after April 30th. You know, I have a desire to. I've got something inside me telling me it's going to be worth it to go. And for the last couple of years, There have been games that are fun. I mean, if you're a fan of baseball, you're always going to enjoy going to baseball games. But to the average fan, you need more of a reason than just it being a baseball game. You want the team to be competitive. You want them to be enjoyable. And the dark question I think that we have to ask ourselves is, when has it become a failure? I mean, the reality at hand here is that the Royals are coming off 106 losses. They tied a franchise record. But the front office has set this precedent of they're done losing. All right. So if they lose 90 to 95 games, it's not going to be celebrated as it shouldn't be. I don't believe this is a flawless roster. I think there's a lot of holes on the roster, but they're also trying to capitalize on a weak division. They're trying to give players in their prime a better chance to get to the postseason. It's tough, though, to be a playoff team when it Stretched over 162 games. There's going to be hot stretches of the season. I mean, even last year, the Royals won, what was it, seven in a row? Eight in a row? That was a team that won 56. So what happens in baseball? And good teams will lose five, six, seven in a row. And it's going to be ugly uh, to watch that team every single night. To me, though, if this team is not within striking distance of a division or a wild card, and I actually believe it's going to be easier to be within striking distance of a divisional title 
than it is to get into the wild card. If this team is out of it by June, that to me is a failure. Uh, even if they are keeping in it, they're hunting uh, for that spot in, in April and May. If they're out of it by the end of June before the All-Star break, it's a failure to me. And I think that most people would say it. And maybe you're saying, you know, through the through the the screen or wherever you're watching it on, whether it's on your phone or your laptop, however you choose to listen to this podcast, you know, maybe you're saying, well, hold on now. You're telling me that, you know, they just have to be competitive through three months and then it's considered a success. To me, this has to stretch into the second half. Uh, that, I think, is my, my mark for the 2024 Royals. If they can give you meaningful baseball after the All-Star break, there's something there. There's something exciting about it. And if I was a little bit more of a, a softer individual to this, I would maybe say, give me fun baseball for the first half. First half of the season, give me a reason. And if it all falls apart in the second half, at least I got half a season. I could take that approach. Some of you may. Some of you are going to say, no, you got to be competing into September. And I think that is the golden scenario. The golden scenario to me, of course, is making the playoffs. But one that's not far behind it, if they got to September and were within five games of a division title, there's, I will not be disappointed if they were to miss the playoffs. Sure, it'd be frustrating, but you're going for five to six months of meaningful baseball. That's a success. A failure is you don't even get to July as a competitive team. And if you think that's easy, the Royals were done by the third weekend last year. You couldn't use the the age-old saying of it's a marathon, not a sprint. I even said it, and I didn't really believe it three weeks in. Because how many teams start 5-20 and and then make the playoffs? You know, that's it's not a very good scenario to be in. To me, though, if they can tread water, really, and that's being nice about it. You tread water in the first half, you're seven out of first in the first half. It's doable. It gives you a reason to go, it's July. It's hot. It, I want to go to the game on a Friday night. I want to go to the game on a random Tuesday night. You know, our... Our podcast is going to hit the road a couple times this season for road games. And good or bad, we'll be there. So I guess it doesn't really apply to me. But maybe it gives you a, an idea of if this team's competing by August, I want to go to a road game. I want to see them play against the Rangers. I think that's in July. I want to go see them play the Rockies. You know, easier places to go to. I want to travel to St. Louis and see them play the Cardinals at Bush Stadium. That might be a little bit of a tease of, of where our podcast may be heading at least once this season. But that's the beauty of a long season. There's ups and downs all the time, but if you tread water long enough, you'll be within striking distance. And with the American League Central being dormant, except for the Royals all off season, they're going to have a chance as long as they don't completely shoot themselves in the foot from the get-go. I'm sure that is on everybody's mind after spring training. Can they start hot in April, which always seems to avoid the Kansas City Royals. Well, that's going to do it for another edition of Locked On Royals and the Locked On Podcast Network. I've been your host, Jack Johnson. Be sure to give me a follow on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. And catch us wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts. We're also on YouTube and Odyssey. For YouTube, be sure to hit that follow button and subscribe. Before we say goodbye, let's give a shout out to Locked On Sports Today. It's here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel. Tomorrow, it is going to be our Mailbag Friday, so get your questions ready and start sending them my way. But until then, you take it easy, Kansas City.